Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have here a very exciting guest lecture here at Helbus. We have here the Professor Emeritus William D. Danko from the State University of New York at Albany. Bill is best known of the exceptional bestseller book he co-authored, The Millionaire Next Door. The book remained actually three years in the uh, bestseller list of New York Times magazine. And uh, today, Bill is going to tell about the very interesting and surprising uh, findings that are reported in the books. They are about how millionaires actually do become millionaires. So uh, welcome, Bill, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. Yes, this thank is you. A well, it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Bill. Uh, can we perhaps start? Can you um, uh, start by uh, telling a little bit about your background and, and how did you become involved in, in studying millionaires? Yes, it goes back to the 1970s when I was a student at the State University of New York at Albany. One of my professors was Tom Stanley. Yes. And I took a consumer behavior class from him. And I got an A, <laughs> and he liked my work ethic and attitude. And he invited me to take part in his very first study of the affluent market. And so really, the, the roots of rock and roll, so to speak, <laughs> where all of this happened was really 1973 with that very first study. And then over the next 20 years, uh, I went on to get my PhD at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and he went off to teach elsewhere and subsequently left academia to do uh, this kind of consulting and research. But over those 20 years, we engaged in all sorts of consulting studies and academic studies. And, the, you know, the problem with some academic studies, I, and I'm not belittling it, but you put your heart and soul into some of these studies that'll be read by 12 graduate students. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's good for those 12 graduate students, that's for sure, or I think it is. But we decided, you know, we have a message that is so much bigger than just being confined to the academic literature. And so it was in 1993, Tom Stanley called me up and we engaged in a project called Big Hat, No Cattle. And it's about who has the appearance of wealth and who really has the wealth. And so that's really the genesis of, of how we got there. So in 1993, when we launched this new project, we were able to then publish it in 1996. And then 4 million copies later, it's... Uh, it's been a rich opportunity. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I have had the book for a very long time and I have actually bought it to my brother and, and to my children. So I, I, I really believe in the principles. Uh, can, you, can you tell a little bit about the methodology? Like how did you, how did you do the research that, that is um, described in the book? Yeah, some people will, will say this was a, um, you know, an overnight success when we launched it in 1996. But when you go back to the 20 years of research that Tom and I had been doing, we not only had historical data sets, we had data from the US government, the Census Bureau, the Internal Revenue Service. And in, in fact, one of the data sets is called Statistics of Income, SOI Bulletin which publishes on a routine basis about the economic vitality of the United States. And so we had our paper and pencil questionnaires. We had focus groups. We had personal interviews. We had secondary data. We had what is called convergent validity. And all of these various studies that we have done and read about helped us form the uh, basic questionnaire for the uh, millionaire next door, or as it was called in its, uh, uh, in its birth, big hat, no cattle. 
very good, very good. Uh, can you tell about the incident when you when you tried to interview the the uh, the deca, deca millionaires, the, the people who have at least wealth of ten million dollars? Yeah, ten million dollars back then was certainly astronomical, and it still is. You know, in America right now, to be one of those one percenters, you know, the reviled one percenters on the top of the distribution, you only, and I use the word only, only need a net worth of about $11 million. And so clearly, being in that $10 million category when we were doing this research, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, was really quite significant. Well, one of the problems is that we have these stereotypical ideas as to who the wealthy are. And it wasn't uncommon for the banks and trust companies to hire people uh, to manage wealth for these individuals. And, and, and make no mistake, there are some individuals who really are that well-heeled Mercedes-Benz custom suits, Rolex watches, but the reality is <laughs> there are far more millionaires who have ordinary lifestyles and money is not the objective, it's doing a good job in what they're doing. And so consequently, you know, one of the examples that, that is so uh, dramatic that illustrates this is when we had, um, a, a private meeting with some of these DECA millionaires. And I went up to this individual because we had yes. the pate, we had the gourmet food, we had some Bordeaux 70 wine. <laughs> and I went up to this individual and said, sir, may I offer you a glass of Bordeaux 70? And he looked at me and said, son, there are two kinds of beer that I like, free, and Budweiser. <laughs> and so what we have here is a real disconnect. And the disconnect is we think all the millionaires have this well-heeled, high-flying, highly visible lifestyle. But in fact, there are so many that just have this normal, dull, <laughs> nondescript lifestyle. And a lot of that is because of the occupations that they're engaged in. And we can talk more about that if we have time, the occupations. Yeah, yeah, please do. So I, I think you, you that, that was also a, a bit of a surprise that in, in what kind of occupations they yeah. are. You, you know, um, in the book, of course, got to get the plug in here. <laughs> okay. uh, in appendix three of the book, it's on page 256, at least in this um, edition, we have a litany we have a litany of about 150 occupations of yes. people who have become uh, millionaires. And, you know, one thing we realize is that most millionaires are self-employed. In fact, the Federal Reserve has a study that comes out every three years and consistently every three years, that ratio is about five to six to one. The self-employed are about five to six times more likely to be millionaires than those who work for somebody else. Okay. That's just a historical fact, at least in the United States. But when you look at some of the occupations, for example, bovine semen distributors, you know, cows, cattle, propagating the next generation of beef, a bovine semen distributor is a very organic job. You know, yes. you wear rubber gloves, rubber boots. <laughs> it's, um, it's not for the faint of heart. You drive a pickup truck and you make a lot of money because it's a specialized technique that is used to propagate the next uh, generation of the bovine uh, population. But here's the problem. It's yes. a niche that is so unique that there's not a lot of people clamoring to get into it, saying, boy, when I grow up, I want to be a bovine semen distributor. You're not going to hear that. And, you know, and one of the problems we have found is that, okay, 
we have a successful person who makes a lot of money in this very dirty job, this very organic job. Could you imagine then sitting their daughter down at the breakfast table saying, my dear, when you grow up, I want you to inherit this business and be a bovine semen distributor. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Instead, what that wealthy parent is going to say is, boy, this is hard work. I put my heart and soul into it, but I want something better for my children. I want them to go to a private school. I want them to have luxury. <laughs> I want them to do everything I don't have. And then it dissipates. It is so hard to keep it going from generation after generation. Okay, that's just one example. The, the bovine semen distributor and how it's so-called day class A, it's so lower class to say that is an occupation that I think is worthwhile to engage in. So another example, a trailer park owner trailer parks. What's that all about? I know an individual who owns three trailer parks and he says, Bill, here's the idea. People own their own trailer and I have a piece of developed land that has utilities on it. The sewage, the electricity, the water. And if they don't pay their rent on time for renting that plot of land, we have a whole new definition of rolling stock. We can get rid of that trailer very easily, more easily than evicting somebody from an apartment. Now look, I'm not saying it's good to evict anybody. Everyone deserves good housing. But when you look at the business model some of these people have created, it's genius. You know, I know people who own parking lots <laughs> if they charge $20 a day for people to park their car in a parking lot where there's no infrastructure other than asphalt, right? And it can be a real money-making machine. Now, how are things going to fare with the COVID virus and people not driving as much and people not having to go to downtown uh, office buildings? There can be some real opportunities and some real disruptions that we see here. But anyway, in Appendix 3, there's a whole litany of occupations. Now, sure, there are attorneys, there are medical doctors, there are architects, the professions, and that's all well and good. But 80% of them are these millionaires next door who have these nondescript occupations and don't have to display social status. That is really key. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Um, uh, do you think they became millionaires because they chose an occupation where there is not much competition or, or is that like irrelevant to the... No, you, it, you know, it, it's really finding a niche where you can thrive, isn't it? And so, and you look at you know, we have a program on American television, and maybe you have it there too. It's called Dirty Jobs. And Mike Rowe, R-O-W-E, is the, um, the host of it, who does all sorts of things like draining swamps, raising earth crawlers for uh, fishing, um, getting into sewers. My point is this, not that he enjoys doing that, he demonstrates on how there are so many jobs in the world that have to be done and not a lot of people want to do them because, well, they're dirty. But if you can find a niche with less competition, you'll be much better off. Okay. That's everybody good. wants, yeah, everybody, look, we are very blessed in America to have a lot of physicians and a lot of dentists. <laughs> But how many dentists does one community need? How many physicians does one community need? And what we need are physicians out in rural areas and underserved areas. And so consequently, just because you go to medical school, you say, I want to work in the big city. That's all well and good, but you're going to be competing with everybody and his brother and sister. <laughs> That's the problem. So if you can get a job where the competition 
is less likely to be a hindrance to you, you're going to be so much better off. And I guess that's really the key point here. It all starts with having a good income stream, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. So with, without having an income stream, we can't talk about savings. We can't talk about investing. <laughs> we, we can't talk about a lot of things. We have to have a suitable income stream to get things started. And then we can diversify and get into a niche that we can really develop to our advantage. Okay, this is a good point. Uh, you mentioned earlier that 80% uh, of, of, of the millionaires are, <clears throat> are self-employed, so they might have a, big, a bigger income stream, but, but do you still think that it's possible to become a millionaire if you're just an ordinary uh, salary person, you, you and your, your spouse are, are like uh, in a just ordinary, uh, ordinary work instead of owning, owning yeah. a business? Yeah, you know, a, f a few years ago, I was at a ceremony at my university where a husband and wife donated at that time a million dollars to the library. So they're donating to a state university a million dollars. And a couple of things that this, uh, th this husband and wife were in their 80s, they're probably no longer with us. But they said a couple of things. First, there are no pockets in burial shrouds. You can't take it with you. But secondly, the guy who made the money worked for the postal service. He lived in a very modest house. He didn't have an extravagant lifestyle and he kept saving and investing in equities. And well, he accumulated more than a million dollars to which he gave a big portion of that to the university saying, I want to keep the flame alive and have other future generations enjoy the wealth that we have created. So yeah, it is possible to work for the state or the federal government or at an ordinary job because it comes down to how frugal are you going to be? what is your expectation on how your lifestyle will expand? And, you know, okay. and, and, and if I could just point out, a very good example in The Millionaire Next Door is the profile of two physicians we call Dr. North and Dr. South. Yes. Dr. North is a very, they're, they're both physicians, they both have high incomes, but Dr. North has a substantially larger net worth than Dr. South. And it's all based on behavior. Dr. North says, I only buy depreciated automobiles. I am going to have somebody give me the gift of early depreciation. Dr. South, on the other hand, every other year, he's in the market spending hours trying to find the latest and fastest and shiniest new car. And as soon as he drives it off the parking lot, of course, it depreciates. Now, is there anything wrong with having nice things in your life? Of course not. But how in the world is Dr. South going to be able to retire without having to take a real hit and a change in his lifestyle? Dr. North, on the other hand, is on cruise control. You know, he works, he saves, he invests, and when it comes time to retire, he can do it without a penalty to his current lifestyle. I was at a seminar. <clears throat> I met a dentist, a young woman. She must have been 35 years old, and she showed me her hands. And I said, oh, my goodness, they were all arthritic. She goes, I've just started my career, and I can't do my career anymore. I need to have an adoption of this frugal lifestyle <laughs> that becomes the cornerstone of wealth building. So I hope we set her straight. I hope we shall see. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry. I'm... So, uh, you you started describing the <clears throat> the uh, lifestyle of the affluent or the millionaires. Can you <clears throat> can you point out a couple of other life <clears throat> lifestyle choices that they are making? Yeah, you know, 
if you watch the news, I don't know how the, the Finnish news portrays America, but I can tell you, I don't watch the national news anymore uh, on TV because it's going to be about the burning of uh, Portland, Oregon. It's going to be about another mass shooting. It's going to be about victimization. Uh, I mean, we have some real cultural problems that have to be resolved in America, that's for sure. And I, they will be resolved. When I talk to my friends in law enforcement and I ask them, what can an affluent person do to avoid mayhem? And they say, keep a low profile. You know, one of the uh, problems is uh, you may have heard of the famous bank robber named Willie Sutton. Yes. And he was asked once, well, sir, why do you rob banks? And he says, because that's where the money is. <laughs> well, if you have the trappings of wealth, the big house, let me just move this a little bit to get out of the sun. Yes. Okay. How's that? If you have the big house, the flashy car, the flashy lifestyle, and if you're a crook, who are you going to victimize? <laughs> somebody who looks rich or somebody who has no money? You know, one of the bizarre comments from the Internal Revenue Service, uh, our tax collectors, is even if your child is kidnapped, you cannot use them as a deduction if they're not in your house. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> you know, that is so cruel, <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's um, the unfortunate reality. And that's one of the rulings that the uh, IRS has, uh, has issued. So, so keeping a low profile. See, look, you, you can still live very nicely without spending a lot of money. That's, that, that is the bottom line. And if you're not spending, you're able to invest. And that really is the benefit. You know, it, it was 1985 when Professor um, Enrico, um, uh, what's his last name? Modigliani, Modigliani won the Nobel Prize in economics. And his thesis was about the life cycle of money. And he said, when you are young, you work for money when you are old, money works for you. Okay. <laughs> it, it's a beautiful model. And that's the way it's supposed to be. But here is the problem, at least in our society. There are so many people living paycheck to paycheck. They're not thinking about investing. And they're not thinking about the future. They're the thinking about today. And that is really the reason why we have opportunities but so few people take advantage of those opportunities. That's the key here. Being able to recognize the opportunity to take advantage of it is the way you build wealth. Okay, <clears throat> that's very interesting too. Uh, so to, one, one of the key is to, to uh, spend less than you earn so that you save. Uh, did you study where did the people actually invest their money? Did they invest it in their own businesses or did they invest it in, in stock market or? or uh, yes, investing? all of the above. <laughs> yeah, the uh, one thing we know that the wealthier you are, the more likely you, you are to have investment real estate. And so not just your personal home. See, having your personal home is wonderful, but having somebody also pay you for the privilege of owning a, an appreciating asset, such as, well, hopefully an office building that will come back in vogue one day. I hope so. Um, you know, it's been difficult during this virus. But the, uh, so real estate is certainly one of them. And investing in your own business is, is always a good idea. But also the stock market and the bond market have been very uh, useful. Now, there was an interesting um, challenge that Warren Buffett, one of the in most uh, rich, one of the richest people in the world, he challenged the hedge fund operator to see whether the hedge fund strategy can beat just investing in a simple S&P 500. 
I forgot what period of time it was, and it, and it was a bet they did for charity. Well, Warren Buffett won because he invested in the S&P 500 and the hedge fund operator was doing all the ins and outs and changes and really being erratic, thinking that they're doing the right thing and trying to time the market. I get it. But there's a lot to be said about the steady as you go instead of trying to beat the market. So having some vanilla things like real estate, equities, bonds, investing in your own business, investing in your own education. <laughs> these, these are all very good things that add value. In fact, the Department of Labor, this was in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, had a graph of since the COVID virus hit and looking at from the beginning of the year to probably September 30th, they looked at what was the unemployment rate for various educational levels. And they said the people who had at least a bachelor's degree and above are almost even right now in their employment opportunities. And those who had less education are still struggling. I get it. Education pays, it really does. I, you know, of course I spent 31 years at the university and I, 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 you know, I never left school. You know, one of the pieces of advice my mother gave me was Bill, stay in school. Well, I did undergraduate, MBA, PhD, then went to the university to teach. I never left school until a few years ago. <laughs> I took her literally. <laughs> uh, you also mentioned that uh, these people who became become millionaires, they, they allocate their time, energy, and money in a special way. What do you mean by allocating the energy? Yeah, you look at what is productive. Um, you know, I like doing my own yard work. I cut my own grass, rake my own leaves. Now, some people would say that's not very productive for a PhD to do. But on the other hand, I don't belong to a gym. <laughs> I get my exercise outside. I get my vitamin D outside. And I enjoy working outside. It's, it's, it's really fun. And so when you look at it, how, what are the trade-offs? What are the opportunity costs? What should you be doing? What is a high value use of your time? And of course, you know, I never met Stephen King uh, the, the, the fiction writer for uh, you know, horror stories, but he wrote a book called On Writing. And one of the things that really stuck to me, uh, stuck with me, is um, about the discipline needed to write a book and how he does it. And every day, every day of the week, there are no vacations until it's done. He sits down for at least four hours and just in a closed room, no distractions, and just does it. He said, this is an efficient use of my time. He wonders about some of these writers who just casually say, well, I got to get inspired. I, I'm not in the mood. And he says, well, what are they doing? Knitting Afghans? <laughs> you know, it's, it's about focus, isn't it? In fact, Benjamin Franklin, 250 something years ago, said, there is no gain without pain. And it's about the discipline of sitting down and allocating your time and getting the job done. It is so easy to get distracted. This is one of the reasons I love being up in the mountains. You know, it's, there are very few distractions. It is absolutely a godsend to be here. Yeah, I think, I think this is a really important lesson in, in many ways. I totally agree that it's it's very easy to get distracted and, and uh, in our times, like million times easier than uh, at Ben Franklin's times. But on the other hand, it's really interesting and encouraging to learn that uh, you can become world famous author simply by writing four hours each day, which basically should be possible for anyone. I mean, it's, it's just four hours still. <laughs> well, you know, another one of my friends who writes history books, uh, 
has a sign in his office that says, writing is nothing more than putting one word after another. <laughs> and he also says, you can't revise a blank page. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Get it down, write something, revise as necessary. But the point is, it, it can be done. And it it's all about focus and discipline. And uh, is it really a goal that's worthy of you? And, and, and certainly with the millionaire next door, that was a very worthy goal, you know, to say, you know, here's the concept, you know, and, you know, it was interesting. So this was, you know, 1993 when the research to it was, was taking place. And I said, oh boy, you know, here I am, you know, I already have my PhD in hand. I already have married. I have three kids. All I need is another time consuming project. <laughs> <laughs> to to keep me uh, to keep me busy, but because uh you know I I believed in the research that we were doing and the success we've had you know previously, it, it was really something that had to be done, and you know and it, then it took discipline, focus, determination, it, sweat, it, tears, blood. <laughs> it, it was it was good. I'm glad it was done. Yeah, and it turned out, out well. By the way, we have one question from, from our student called Johannes. He's asking that the millionaires you studied, are they all American or did you study also other nationalities? No, they, they are all American. Yes. So I, but you know what? Um, the millionaire next door is in something like 30 different languages. So it's in Japanese, it's in Thai, it's in German. It's in Chinese, um, it's in Spanish. So I, I think there's, you know, it, it, and I've done speeches in Canada and Australia, so in the English speaking world, so to speak. But my point is, I think there are some universal truths here. And you know what, uh, it, it, and the student who asked the question, you know, this would be a very good um, research project for you to engage in, take the same topics that are in the millionaire next door, as well as, you know, the richer than a millionaire, which we'll get to momentarily, um, and investigate them and see whether these same concepts are applicable in your particular society. I encourage that. This is, this is good. Yes, we are, we are going to talk about that with Johannes. I, I, I truly think that the, just the same principles apply. Uh, but yes, let's go to the next book. Can you briefly tell about what, what, what is this? It's, it says richer than a millionaire. So can you briefly yeah. sum up what, what you, you tell know, about it? Again, you know, The Millionaire Next Door came out in 1996. And, and that was a pivotal year in my life. Um, I had a quadriplegic brother named Tony. In fact, the book is dedicated to him, Anthony J. Danko. Um, he had been under the care of my mother, but she had a debilitating stroke at that time. And so in 1996, I'm on a book tour with Millionaire Next Door, doing speaking engagements, making lots of money, teaching at the university. And also, I became the primary caregiver to my brother. And my wife and I made a pledge to keep him out of a nursing home. And so we bought him a house, paid, you know, arranged for all his care. But every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, just about every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for 20 years, I was his personal aide. And here's a guy who couldn't even scratch his nose, you know, had to feed him, bathe him, dress him, and everything else. But my point is this I love my brother. He died in 2015. But during that time, you, here I am, you know, I, a PhD, university professor, best-selling author, bon vivant, you know, life was wonderful, but I'm also a healthcare aide looking at somebody who has the same genetic makeup as I and has nothing but faith and hope and a positive outlook, but can't even touch his nose. Uh, and so it, it gives you a perspective. I said, well, what's it all about? You know, 
money is good. There's no question. And that's the premise of richer than a millionaire. Money is good, but money and happiness are better. And so what we did with, with and it was really critical. Um, the book came out in 2017 and we really couldn't, or I couldn't really devote the time necessary with my colleague, uh, Rich Van Ness. I might note that Tom Stanley also died in 2015 from a car crash. But my point is Rich Van Ness, who lives near me in upstate New York, and we've been working together on a number of projects for 30 years, I don't know, a long time. And on our various meetings, we talked about, well, what kind of legacy do we want to leave our children and our grandchildren? You know, and we started taking notes and notes turned into sentences and sentences turned into paragraphs and paragraphs turned into chapters. And by 2017, we had uh, the, the basis of, of the book and it's, um, it, it's been good and it's, and it's been attractive to very, um, a, a different kind of audience, namely the charitable gift givers. Because what we look at are the psychological constructs based on a, something called subjective well-being, SWB, in the psychology literature. It's a scale that is reliable and valid and, and it's also in the public domain, which is good. I don't have to pay royalties to use it. <laughs> and any student can use it. The scale is in the book. And it's easy to implement. Implement. It's five statements on a seven-point scale. And the way it's used is you can get a low score of five or a high score of 35. And essentially, if you score between five and 19, you're considered unsatisfied with life, you have turmoil, you're unhappy. If you score 20 or better, you say, okay, I understand my place in the universe. <laughs> I'm at peace with my soul. I, I get it. I know what I'm, I, I understand my mortality. I understand, you know, and having that understanding is really critical. It really is. And so what we did of course, we turn to survey research and we look at those people who are affluent and we find that there's a portion of them who are, are unhappy, but the vast majority are happy. Now, much like we did in The Millionaire Next Door, where we have under accumulators of wealth and prodigious accumulators of wealth, we could do the contrast and compare we look at those who are unhappy but have a lot of money and those who are happy and have a lot of money. And what we find is that there are certain characteristics that seem to be universal among the happy. They are at peace with their soul. They have an understanding of, of, of yes, this is good. I am satisfied. They tend to be very charitable you know, we often think of, well, it's the government's job to create a welfare system and, and a social network, a social support system. But the literature, at least in America, uh, and there's a, there's a book that we reference towards the end of the, the book on recommended reading, it's called Who Really Cares? And it's by Arthur Brooks. And in this book, he says, a society that is really strong is one that's a giving society that doesn't depend on the government. And I found that intriguing. And this is exactly what we find in the life satisfaction measures here. Those who give their time and money to charitable organizations, you know, for the good and not to government, but to other private organizations that are doing, you know, work, in hospitals and social welfare, they tend to be very satisfied and, and also educational systems as well. And so givers are happier. Those who are at peace or are happier, that's a good correlate. And we also have um, um, not being concerned about the future. 
you know, we live in some very difficult times. I get it. But we also have to understand, you know, there's, um, uh, in marketing research, we talk about endogenous variables and exogenous variables. The endo, those variables that we can control, and the exogenous, the ones we can't control but have to understand. Now, this is very similar to something called the serenity prayer, where we ask, help me understand the things that I can control and help me accept the things I can't control and the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but, but once you understand that, it, there's a serenity saying, I can't do a lot about a lot of things. I can't do a lot of things about the macro economy, the political system. I'm just one vote. I'm just one economic engine. You got to understand and accept certain things that are out of your control. But the things you can control, you can control the occupation you choose, right? You know, there is a study by The Economist magazine that looked at what do immigrants look for in a new country? And one of the things they look for, or several things they look for, are something called rule of law, where you know what the rules are, as opposed to just random confiscation uh, from government, okay? And they also look for a solid education system that they'd like their children to be brought up in. They look for a quality of life where people are not under a lot of stress. And sometimes you wonder, again, looking at the national news, uh, what kind of quality of life we're descending to in America right now. But I have hope. And they also look for an environment that allows for an entrepreneurial spirit. And you know, if we have that, if we preserve the entrepreneurial spirit, I have really hope for more millionaires in the future. That's, that's for certain. Okay. This, this so, is very, go ahead. This is very good to hear. We have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Johannes came up with, uh, with another question. Uh, he asks, is the giving a cause or an, eff uh, or an effect of, of their happiness? So which one comes first? Yeah, very good question. Um, you know, first of all, empirically we know at least on a static survey, we can't talk about cause and effect, we can talk about association. But we look at the uh, writings of Benjamin Franklin, and he said to really be wealthy, and this is from his essay called The Way to Wealth, which you can Google, it's about a 3,500 word essay, and it's written under the name Richard Saunders, as in poor Richard's almanac. And what he does, as he lays out the basic ideas of how to become wealthy, but he says, you know, being industrious and being frugal and being prudent are all wonderful things. They sure are. And you can be wealthy by practicing that, at least wealthy in a monetary sense. But he also says, it's all blasted without a blessing from heaven and therefore ask that blessing humbly. Now, where does he get this wisdom? You know, when, when you look at, well, Islam, for example, one of the five tenets or pillars of Islam is almsgiving, being charitable. In Judaism, you know, especially in the book of Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 58, talks about, well, what does the good Jew have to do. They have to give their coat to the naked. They have to feed the hungry. They have to care for the poor. And in Christianity, Matthew 25, in fact, Matthew 25 is what Mother Teresa said, what I'm motivated by in my charitable works is Matthew 25. And that's the passage that says, that which you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. It's about being charitable to the individual. So certainly, major religions and Benjamin Franklin say it's a need to be charitable. And so it's a mandate, really. And so whether there's cause and effect, I don't know. But 
I can't imagine a religion that wants to make you miserable. <laughs> and so maybe it's because you are charitable, you do have this, uh, this better feeling about life and humanity than being just about your, ex about yourself. In fact, you know, you know, towards the end of uh, it, uh, Richer, we have a quote from uh, uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who wrote The Man's Search for Meaning. He survived the Auschwitz concentration camp and was a practicing psychiatrist for many years. He just died maybe 30 years ago. But he wrote in Man's Search for Meaning about don't pursue happiness as an end in itself have a goal bigger than yourself. Being able to help others in something that goes beyond you is going to bring you the happiness and rewards, not only psychological rewards, but also monetary rewards. You know, this is the idea, being a giver instead of a taker. You know, once we just limit our life to ourself and say, it's about me, you're never going to have enough. In fact, look, if I can just bring out one other point, I know you're, we're going on 45 minutes here, which is, uh, I told you, we, we can go two hours. No, we can't. <laughs> Maybe we can. But um, one of the uh, graphs in Richer Than a Millionaire is where we ask individuals, what is your current net worth and how much do you think you need to be wealthy? Well, if your current net worth is $500,000 on the graph, we demonstrate empirically, you need two and a half million dollars to feel rich. If you have two and a half million dollars, you think you need five million to feel rich. If you have five million, you think you need eight million to think to feel rich. I can tell you, in the United States, the median net worth is about $100,000. So there's half the population who has less than 100,000. If you're a millionaire in the United States, you're in the top 12% of the distribution. And as I said previously, if you have $11 million, you're in the top 1%. So how much do you need? How many pairs of shoes do you need? You know. It comes down to this, look, and maybe this will be a good conclusion. The, um, what is the purpose of wealth? I mean, to give it to your kids? Huh. Well, what are you going to do? Uh, spoil them and not give them the incentive to work? I don't think so. Spend it on yourself? Well, we already have a frugal lifestyle, why do that? <laughs> die with a big estate tax and let the government take it? That's no fun. The fourth thing you can do is be charitable, right? So just from a pragmatic perspective, being charitable makes a lot of sense. Now, here's one of the frustrations that I have as an educator, and I know you do too as an educator. It's a conclusion from Benjamin Franklin's essay on the way to wealth. He says, the people heard the message, agreed with it, and then practiced the contrary. <laughs> you know, I hope what I've shared today makes a lot of sense, and, and, it, and it's based on empirical observations, and I'm convinced it makes sense. But so many people will say, but that's too much work. I don't want to focus on that. I want that new car. <laughs> I want to have a lifestyle I can't afford. You know, uh, if you want to really become wealthy, read The Millionaire Next Door. And if you want to really, really become wealthy with true prosperity, read Richer Than a Millionaire. Thank you, Bill. This has been very insightful and, and uh, really valuable. And I think uh, the conclusion, like, you said that uh, have a goal that's bigger than yourself and, and be a giver, not a taker. I think these are very, very sort of good uh, uh, end goals to, to, for, for anyone to have. So Bill, thank you very much for taking your time and, and, and sharing your valuable insight with us. And, and thank you for everybody for participating and, and uh, 
will I will then later be in in contact with you through email yes. and and then and uh, yes. go over a couple well, of things. Well, Harry, I, I I thank you and I thank all the students for attending. You know, I am now an emeritus professor, so it's good to be back into the classroom. So you are my people. I've always called my students my people. You are now my people. So this is great. I look forward to a, a long relationship with your organization. Thank you and be well. Yes, thank you, Bill, very much. Right, be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.